I'm gonna show you one of the most interesting games of the legendary tournament in Zurich. As David Branstein writes in his great book on this tournament, the game is characterized by White's persistent efforts to clear a pass by combinative means for his fianchettoed queen's bishop in order to reach the weakened kingside dark squares. Another theme of this game is the accumulation of small advantages in order to deliver the final blow at the decisive moment. Mark Taimanov playing white started with d4 and Averbach played the Nimzo Indian defense, bishop b4. e3, short castle, bishop d3, threatening e4, completely occupying the center with his pawns, that's why Averbach prevents it by playing d5. Knight f3, b6. Averbach is going to fianchetto his bishop followed by the exchange on c4, after which the bishop's diagonal will be open. Short castle, bishop b7, a3. Now black has to choose, either to spend the tempo and retreat the bishop in order to retain the bishop pair, or, in order not to waste the tempo, to exchange on c3. And that's exactly what Averbach did. Bishop takes c3. However, now white gets the advantage of two bishops. d takes c, bishop takes c4, c5. Averbach attacks white's center. And Taimanov? returns his bishop to the better diagonal, because on this diagonal the bishop controls the crucial e4 square and exerts pressure on black's king side. Knight d7, rook e1. Now, together with the bishop, the rook also supports the pawn and white is threatening to move the pawn on e4 again. And the only way to prevent this is by moving one of his pieces, either the knight or the bishop, on e4. If bishop e4, then white would avoid the exchange of bishops by playing bishop f1, followed by knight d2, attacking the valuable bishop. And after the bishop retreats, white will play e4. That's why Averbach plays knight e4, attacking the pawn on c3. Bishop b2, defending the pawn. So, at the moment, the dark squared bishop is very bad as it's limited by its own pawns on the dark squares. However, as you will see, this bishop will play the most important role in white's attack. And white's strategy is now to clear the path of this bishop. Rook c8, threatening to blockade the queen side by playing c4. That's why Taimanov plays c4 himself. And now Averbach made a mistake. He made a natural looking move, knight f6, supporting his knight, and also defending the h7 pawn, because the bishop is attacking this pawn, and also, further in the game, white can play queen h5 and create checkmating threats on h7. And the knight on f6 is defending h7. However, on f6 the knight is exposed, and white can attack this knight, eliminate it, and you know, threaten checkmate on h7 again. That's why Branstein in his annotations, instead of knight f6, suggests moving this knight to f8, because on f8 the knight will also defend h7, but unlike on f6, on, a, on f8 it would be completely safe and it would be uh, inaccessible for white pieces. And in order to do it, Branstein suggests playing rook c7, followed by queen a8, the queen and bishop battery would be very effective, controlling the long diagonal, followed by rook c8, vacating the f8 square for the knight, both rooks would be placed on the c file, exerting pressure, and followed by knight f8. But Averbach played knight f6. And besides that, the knight on d7 was controlling a very important central square, e5, and as soon as it Left d7, Taimanov exploits this. Knight e5, centralizing his knight. Now the knight on e5 is greatly placed. Besides that, the f3 square is vacated and white can uh, kick the black knight out of the central square. Rook c7 and now a very strong move by Taimanov. Before continuing his active play, his operations on the king side, he creates a small advantage on the queen side because the only uh, weakness on the king side isn't enough so he needs to get the second advantage the second to create a second weakness in black's position and that's why he plays a4 his idea is to play a5 capture on b6 and open the a file for his rook which is currently very passive it isn't doing anything but after 
all this after a5 and a takes b, the rook will control the open a file. So as white is going to play f3 at any moment and uh, push away the knight, uh, Averbach decided to uh, move his knight away in advance and played knight d6, exerting pressure on c4. Taimanov continues his play on the queen side, a5, and now knight d7. So again, the knight returns to d7 because the knight on e5 is intolerable and Averbach wants to exchange it. However, as soon as the knight left f6, from which it controls the h5 square, the white queen moves after preliminary exchange on b6 and opening the a file for his rook. The queen moves to h5, creating checkmating threat on h7. There are multiple ways black can parry this uh, checkmating threat, of course. However, each of these options has its drawbacks. For example, Bronstein gives the following ideas. If bishop e4, closing the bishop's diagonal, then white can play rook d1, placing the rook on the d-file on which the black queen and both knights are placed, and this x-ray would be very unpleasant. Or if h6, then white can play knight g4, and white will constantly threaten to sacrifice on h6 as the king side is weakened, and white can also play d5 at any moment, opening the bishop's diagonal. As you see, both bishops, the queen, and the knight attack the king side, and most of black pieces are placed on the queen side. And uh, in this case, black's position would become critical. Or if f5 blocking the bishop's diagonal, that would eternally weaken the e5 square, and which is even more important, the bishop, the dark squared bishop's value would increase dramatically in this case because pawns don't move back and black wo won't be able in this case to play f6 in order to close the bishop's uh, diagonal and to establish a barrier on its path. Now the bishop will be very strong and it will always attack the g7 square. Or if the knight returns to f6, defending the pawn with tempo, attacking the queen, the queen would simply retreat and white again will threaten to play knight g4 and attack the defender, the only defender of h7, or even d5, attacking the knight with a bishop too. So, after the fall of this knight on f6, again white will renew the checkmating threats on h7. That's why, instead of all this, Averbach played g6, preventing the checkmate. However, this move seriously weakens the dark squares. But... Averbach had his point. After queen h6, he captures on e5, and after d takes e, it turns out that the pawn on e5 is blocking, is closing the bishop's diagonal. And Averbach hoped that uh, for this reason, as the bishop's diagonal is closed, the weakening of the dark squares isn't so dangerous. However, Taimanov proves him wrong. So Averbach plays as his knight on d6 is under attack, plays knight e4. And now Taimanov exchanges his uh, bishop, which is bad, it's limited by its own pawn on c4, and by black pawns on g6 and h7, so it's passive, it isn't really doing anything, and the knight on e4 is very strong, so Taimanov captures on e4. And after bishop takes e4, plays rook d1, attacking the queen. And Averbach played rook d7. And in this position, Averbach thought that the position is more or less equal. White doesn't have any threats. Uh, Averbach thought that everything is under control and offered a draw. However, Taimanov declined the draw because he found a brilliant move. A simple but very effective move which Averbach completely missed. You can pause the video and try to find it. So, Taimanov plays rook d6, completely occupying the d-file, because black cannot capture on d6. If black captures, then after e takes d, the bishop's diagonal is open, and white is threatening checkmate in one. And f6, the only defense, doesn't work, because 
Now you can see the importance of the open A file because the rook invades the seventh rank with great effect, creating checkmating threats together with the queen. And the only defense would be rook f7, but uh, in this case, the king side collapses. That's why after rook uh, d6, uh, Averbach plays bishop b7, simply retreats his bishop. And now Taimanov made a natural looking move. Most chess players would have made this move without thinking much. Rook d1, doubling on the d file and attacking the rook on d7. However, Branstein calls this move, rook d1, a loss of tempo. Because there, is, there was absolutely no need to move the rook on d1. Because if black captures on d6, white wouldn't capture with a rook on d1. Uh, so after rook d1, white wouldn't capture on d6 with a rook anyways. White would capture with a pawn, of course, in order to open the bishop's diagonal and to create immediate checkmating threats. And black wouldn't have time uh, to recapture the pawn with the queen in this case, for this reason, because of the checkmating threat. That's why instead of uh, rook d1, which was completely useless, it would have been much more effective to play h4 and increase the pressure and create new weaknesses on black's king side but taimanov instead of this played rook d1 threatening to capture on d7 now if black plays passively so as the rook on d7 is under attack for example if black plays bishop c8 in order to defend the rook then white has a very strong move e4 opening the lines for his rook and the bishop so white in this case would threaten to play rook d3 followed by rook h3 threatening checkmate on h7 or bishop c1 bishop g5 with tempo attacking the queen followed by bishop f6 again creating checkmating threats on g7. That's why after rook d1 uh, Averbach captures on d6 and of course uh, Taimanov captures with a pawn creating checkmate in one threat on g7. And uh, Averbach plays f6. So the white pawns are cleared from the bishop's uh, diagonal, but now there will be black pawns on, on its way. And Taimanov will clear those, th these pawns too, as you will see. Black simply needs to play queen d7 in order to blockade the pawn, take under control the weaknesses, defend the seventh rank, and everything would be protected in this case. That's why Taimanov found a very strong move. d7. Now this pawn is doomed. There is no way white can defend it because black can simply play bishop uh, c6, for example, uh, and attack the pawn for the second time, capture on d7, and win it. However, it will take a lot of time. Besides that, after bishop c6 and bishop takes d7, the rook would become very strong and the bishop would be pinned because the queen would be behind it and black would need to spend another tempo in order to unpin the bishop and all this would require a lot of time and the black's peace coordination will be broken and while black does all this white will continue his pressure and would create deadly threats on the king side so that was the idea of this pawn sacrifice so after d7, uh, if black plays rook f7, for example, threatening to capture on uh, d7, that would be a mistake because of simple queen h3 attacking e6. And uh, of course, black cannot capture because of simple queen takes e6 check with double attack. And after f5 to defend e6, simply queen h6. And after uh, rook takes d7, Queen g7 check, the queen sacrifice. And after rook takes g7, rook takes d8 check. And uh, white, of course, is wi winning because the rook is also under attack. Besides that, after d7, white has created an immediate threat. Namely, queen takes f8 check. And if the queen takes, then, of course, white immediately promotes to the queen. And if the king takes, then bishop takes f6, attacking the queen. And after the queen moves, again white promotes. 
That's why uh, after d7, Branstein suggests playing e5 in order to close the bishop's diagonal. However, even more to uh, to establish even a stronger barrier uh, in front of this bishop of two pawns. However, in this case, White would prepare f4 and again would try to destroy this obstacle on on its bishop's way. That's why. Uh, after d7, Averbach played bishop c6, the most natural looking move, attacking this dangerous pawn. And we can see now uh, Taimanov's idea, h4. So he simply sacrifices this pawn and creates deadly threats. So, uh, actually after bishop c6, the queen sacrifice on f8 which I showed you in the previous variation, doesn't work. Because after king takes f8, bishop takes f8, the d7 square is defended by the bishop. And black can simply capture on d7. And after rook takes, bishop takes, white doesn't have any advantage. That's why, of course, uh, after bishop c6, Taimanov didn't sacrifice his queen and played h4. So his idea is simple, uh, to play h5 and create further weaknesses on black's king side. Averbach eliminates this dangerous pawn, but now, as you see, uh, the peace coordination is broken, the bishop is pinned, and uh, black's position is critical. And h5, of course, simply threatening to capture on g6. Now, if g5, then white can play f4 and uh, create further weaknesses. As you see, the bishop would be very strong. White is threatening to capture on g5. So for this reason, after h5, uh, Averbach plays g takes h. So now black is two pawns up. However, of course, pawns aren't important in this position because white creates deadly threats to black king. So now Taimanov plays king's gambit on move 30. He plays e4 first, threatening rook d3 and rook g3, check, followed by checkmate. Averbach plays e5 in order to close the bishop's diagonal and open his light-squared bishop's diagonal, but now the king's gambit, the second move of the gambit, f4. Again, destroying the barrier in front of the bishop and clearing its pass. So, if queen e7, because uh, after f4, white is simply threatening to capture on e5, if queen e7 to defend e5, then simply f takes e, f takes e, and bishop takes e5. And after queen takes, rook takes d7. And white is winning on the spot, creating deadly threats. That's why after f4, Averbach captures on, uh, on f4. He accepts the gambit, so to speak. But now, as you see, the bishop's diagonal is open. One of the pawns is removed from its way. So after removing his own pawns on c3 and d4, he, Taimanov, removed the black pawn from e5. And the last obstacle is the f6 pawn. So he plays rook d6 attacking the pawn on f6 for the third time, and black's position simply collapses. Queen e8, and bishop takes f6. So we can observe the triumph of this bishop. Now it has become a deadly bishop. So, rook f7, because of course white was threatening simply checkmate in one move, rook f7, but rook d5, creating a simple deadly threat rook g5 check and uh, followed by checkmate and there is no defense against this threat that's why in this position after rook d5 Averbach resigned and now i recommend watching another great game of this tournament in which the world champion max uwe carried out a phenomenal counterattack. but first hit the like button as it's really helpful for the channel growth see you in next videos